Good morning and thank you for joining us for today's presentation and call. Uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, Bonhoeffer Fund was launched in 2017. It invests globally in companies in disrupted and fragmented industries and misunderstood sectors that exhibit opportunity sets and management qualities that have proven effective in more developed markets. Keith is going to walk us through his 2022 highlights reel, uh, highlighting his annual themes. Um, and he'll be discussing some specific holdings within the portfolio and the unique frameworks that he uses to uncover growth opportunities in slower growing markets. While we will open it up to uh, Q&A in the end, we also invite you to submit questions in the chat and I'll be sure to bring it to Keith's attention uh, in real time. And if you wish to ask a question live, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Before I hand it over to Keith, please be advised that this presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to constitute a sale, solicitation, or advice. Keith, I'll hand it over to you for the presentation. Okay, thanks a lot, Jessica. Hopefully, uh, y'all are y'all are doing well here. It's a it's a cold day here in Rochester, just starting starting the winter time here, but that's part of where we're at being up here in Rochester. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, our, our overall themes, um, and a little bit about the portfolio in 2020, where we're at, where we're, where we're moving towards in terms of historically what we've done. So, okay. So just, just starting out, um, the Bonhoeffer Fund was started in 2017. Um, as Jessica mentioned, our initial strategy was focusing on value and special situations in emerging and developed markets. The strategy has evolved since we've we've started primarily over the last few years where we're including framework we're focusing on growth um growth is a very important component of value and so what we've tried to do is we've tried to uh look at wh what are the sort of the drivers of growth what's really driving growth and some of the themes that we've sort of focused on that to generates growth and maybe places that are less recognized by the market are consolidation transition and then some innovation, a lot of the innovation from organic growth is can be more gen generally recognized by the market, but more of the consolidation and transition is where the, more of the opportunities are because there's both risk and reward with those. And, and that's that's where the market can, uh, you know, potentially misprice a number of securities. The other, the other aspect of current market conditions that, that have changed over the past 12 months has been interest rate adjustments. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and some opportunities that we're, we're finding and, and maybe some some interesting aspects of the, of the portfolio from that perspective. Um, so what I'm going to over what I have in here is I've overview. This is an overview of the themes that we've historically sort of had in the portfolio. You see compound mispricings. Those are places where you buying a security in the capital structure that's actually undervalued. So that's an aspect of our initial sort of set of themes. Mischaracterized firms. These are firms that that are maybe part of two different industries, transitioning from one industry to another, and the valuations of the industries may be different, significantly different. And as a result, you know, we're taking advantage of the, the market looking at the one aspect of the firm that may be lower valued versus higher valued. And as it transitions, there should be an increase in value from that, or multiple from that perspective. Public LBOs, these are situations where there's a modest amount of leverage in companies where the where they've got where they where they have a really good core business and they're using leverage to magnify the returns and the follow then the, the follow the new one is sort of consolidation which we've sort of mentioned over the past year here and as you see the the distribution in the portfolio what's happened is there's a good amount of consolidation and that's where primarily most of the newer securities and you'll see we've, we've numbered these securities the the ones on the bottom are primarily our new book purchases and so in essence, that, that's where most of the, the focus, the, the newer focus of the of the um of the portfolio has been thus far. To give you another overview, just in terms of the characteristics of the portfolio, you'll see our portfolio in general has characteristics of lower PEs, you know, somewhat higher growth rates, let's say, than the overall MSCI, low EV to EBITDA, and then relatively low debt. We also have relatively small size. A lot of that's driven by our, our our holdings in in other countries, especially South Africa, where the average holding size is relatively small, we do we do have some multi billion dollar companies in the U S. too, and we'll see that as we're going through. Asbury is a specific example of that that we'll be going through a little bit more detail later. Um, so let's see. So our overall themes. So first of all, we're, we're, what we're trying to what we're trying to capture here is unrecognized growth. 
In other words, growth that doesn't show up in the pricing today. And there's two, two areas where I think we've been focused, where we see there's some opportunities in this. The first is consolidation growth. We describe it when bigger is better. There's sometimes when it's better, 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 sometimes when it's not, but consolidation growth is clearly a case where you can see companies over time in consolidating industries. If you look at their chart and go up and to the right, what that means is the market hasn't correctly anticipated the growth that's in these businesses over time. And it's re, re, repricing them each time it's doing an acquisition or a major increase in earnings over time. And the second aspect of this is transitioning from a low return on invested capital to high return on invested capital industries. One way to do that is to use the return on incremental capital to sort of identify these firms. And you examine the market factors and strategy to determine this, if they're persistent or not. And an example we're going to show here is a company called Auto Hellas, which is a Greek rental firm that over time has increased its return on incremental capital. And that has flowed to the return on invested capital over time as the businesses it's gotten into have been uh, better and better. And then then, then, then the last, excuse me, the, la the last piece here is... Um, basically is is basically sort of the interest rate interest rate changes that we had mentioned previously so so when is bigger better um primarily bigger is better when you get economies of scale um what this really can learn to lead to is higher margins and turns with larger size there's two two flavors that economies of scale come in is both local and national, at least on a geographic basis. I guess you can say this is also true on a functional basis. And the one thing we try to do is avoid sort of when, when you look at these businesses, you want to avoid diseconomies of scale. Some specific things you can think about this would be like personal services, like let's say an accountant that's going to provide a personal service to someone that doesn't really become very scalable. It's all really tied to the individual, those types of businesses or maybe a really unique restaurant in a spe specific city. Those are places where as it gets bigger, it may get worse because the quality of what's being provided there isn't there. So we try to focus, we basically try to avoid those types of industries. And so from a from a from um, from an overall cash flow perspective in terms of growth, there's two, there's two places where we can get growth. The first one is sort of, is first one is from, uh, is from cash flow. Um, and basically that includes organic growth. And then the advantage of having organic growth is you have more control and can generate returns without goodwill. Consolidation is basically you're going to get cash flow growth. And, and basically what you're going to do there is you're going to get cash flow growth, but basically you're paying goodwill. In other words, you're going to pay an amount above the cost, typically above the cost to recreate the specific, the specific asset you're purchasing. And then there's different types of consolidation. There's geographic or, or functional areas. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to entry and, and what you're trying to do either here is to enter into a new geographic or related functional area. Related functional area would be an example of sort of vertical integration. And so what we're going to look at is what's our approach to sort of what I, what's described as sort of fragmented markets. Um, and so what is the market, is it consolidating or fragmenting is an important aspect of this. Um, an important, an important aspect of, important factor in sort of market slash security selection. And why it's really important is consolidation can lead to less competition, which is which will lead to higher returns. And fragmentation can lead to more competition, which will lead to lower returns in general. So examples of companies, examples of each of these. So fragmentation examples, even though streaming seems to be consolidating, the overall media distribution seems to be fragmented. So there's a number of different places where people can distribute media, and that's going to lead to more lower competition and overall lower prices. Great examples of this are both airline and trucking deregulation, where in essence, where in a deregulated example, um, there was a, a regulated market and therefore um, there's pricing power. When deregulation happened, that sort of went away and created a lot of value destruction. And so those are some examples of fragmented. Now, the other part in terms of consolidation, there's a lot of interesting consolidation examples. Um, right now, one, one thing that we've got in the portfolio is looking at equipment leasing. That's a perfect example of one. There's automobile distribution, which we'll be talking about a little bit later in terms of specifically Asbury. In value retailing, there's academy sports and at home in the U.S. where that's an example. And then in connectivity, there's consolidated communications and frontier. So the, one of the key aspects that we look at in terms of trying to identify interesting situations is, is trying to identify markets where there's fragmentation versus consolidation. So in fragmented markets, 
these are sort of characteristics. You have you can have long runways associated with consolidation, and what you get is a, you get cost synergies associated with this. Um, they can lead to cash flow growth and greater greater than market growth. So if you look at some of the businesses with this consolidation going on, the market itself, for example, in automobile distribution, the market isn't growing. It's growing at maybe GDP, but you can actually get some enhanced growth as a result of of the the ability to buy other businesses that are in this market and sort of consolidate and, and increase sales from that perspective. Um, an additional aspect of fragmented market is innovate any kind of innovation can additionally fragment markets so what's happened for example in the online automobile industry in the in the auto distribution business for example now you've got online retailers offline retailers and omnichannel this has happened across the retail landscape but that's, those are specific examples and what you can do with this is you can select the best across markets and geographies um so what we tried another aspect of the business when we look at these fragmented markets we examine the incumbents and see whether the incumbents have the ability to adapt the innovation versus actually the the disruptor and so if the if the incumbent can adopt the innovation without destroying its value chain um then then you're in a position where what you can do is you can say okay the incumbents are going to have a huge advantage versus the disruptor because they have the existing customers and they can just adopt the innovation um, and basically use it with their existing customers, and therefore the disruptors at a disadvantage. Where the disruptors at an advantage, a, a big advantage is that if to adopt the innovation, someone has to, you have to totally redo your value chain. Then the the prime, the best approach for an incumbent to do is to spin companies out. But we're looking for more of the latter, where the incumbent can actually adopt the innovation and and enhance his value and his or her value and then actually accelerate the growth above the market growth um market growth rate that's existing at the time um so the real one of the interesting questions of this is there's a consolidation process and there's there's two different phases there's probably th that I'd like to look at there's first there's early early innovation early, early prior consolidation where the top five has say less than 15 percent there's a really long runway what you can see in these cases is primarily advantages of local economies of scale, maybe not national. There's a lot of future advantages of the, in the yet to be seen market. And that's where there's a lot of opportunity here because in essence, all these all these benefits are, are to be determined and therefore they're not priced into the market at this point. Some examples are US and Q European car dealerships, international auto rental, US equipment rental and plastic packaging. Now there's a that's one place that you can invest in terms of consolidation. There are some later cases. Now, what happens in the later cases is you actually see the economics in the businesses getting better in terms of these national economies of scale, local economies of scale. And in that in that case, traditional relative value works because it's a more stable situation. Some examples of that is the U.S. auto rental market, where we're down to like three major competitors. Um, and can packaging, where we're down to three major competitors. And so that's where traditional value investing can work. But I think where a lot of the, the unrecognized growth is in, in the early stages of the market. But you don't want to be too early, because if you're too early, then you're really not going to get any economies of scale. But if you're just at sort of an inflection point where you start to see companies exhibiting economies of scale, that's a real interesting point, I think, because I think the market needs to have some evidence that that this economies of scale are actually working to really reward companies um, in any type of basis. And so those are the situations we look at. So right, for example, right now we're we're looking at a lot of situations in the US in terms of the car dealership market, because it's sort of at that at that inflection point where we can actually see some players getting actual synergies. If you look at the European car dealership market, it's much earlier on and you really can't see much of that. A lot of them are still private companies. And so in essence, it's a it's a there's, there's a question of, okay, this is an interesting theme, but there's also where on the point do you want to actually value? Where, where do you want to invest and where is maybe the greatest opportunity? Some favorable factors when looking at the sort of consolidation pros, prospects, there's some ownership, some management teams that are not economically driven. That's a, a negative, a positive factor is if you have economically driven ownership. So for example, some family run companies, the focus isn't economics, it's basically prestige of the family. Therefore, those that would be an unfavorable factor in terms of a particular sort of company you're looking at. The other, another thing I've noticed is there's certain friendly, certain friendly regulatory or cultural regimes. And this really gets back to, okay, what's the regulatory setup in the country, but then also where is the country in the spectrum of going from family owned businesses 
to independent shareholder owned businesses. If it's earlier on in that process where most of the businesses are family owned businesses, you're not going to see a whole lot of consolidation because of the dynamics going on with the families. And you see this in a lot of emerging markets, even in a good number of European markets. But if there's more investor owned businesses, you'll see consolidation becoming a bigger part of it. And that's primarily in the US, UK, um, Australia. Those, those, I think, are the biggest markets where maybe the Netherlands, where, where there's a good amount of consolidation going on from a cultural perspective. And then finally, is there supplier support? I know in the automobile dealer market, historically, there was some restrictions on, on basically buying certain dealerships in certain markets because some of the OEMs were concerned about market control. In other words, if the Toyota prevented certain groups from buying like greater than a certain percentage market share in a particular market, but that's been relaxed recently. And therefore that market becomes more favorable for consolidation. And then, so if we go back to, if you go back to various, what I described as sort of consolidation models, there's a few of these models we've talked about them in some of the previous presentations. Um, there's some very interesting models that people have put together. We'll, we'll, slight, we'll go through them um, a little bit here. The first one is categorization in terms of consolidation, categorization by level of integration. Both Scott Management and Canuck Analyst have come up with uh, interesting models along those lines. And then also a benchmarking. How do you basically benchmark these consolidation models? One way to look at that is looking at return on capital plus organic growth as a way to try and measure you know, the effectiveness uh, of these particular models. But the key thing here is we're looking at future returns, and these are based upon three things. Firstly, successfully implementing the strategy. Second of all, providing returns to minority shareholders, because consolidation can happen, but if you as a minority shareholder aren't going to be able to take advantage of that or get or get the benefit, then that's, that's going to be difficult. That's primarily, I think, the situation in a lot of places where you've got let's say a family owned company, you do have some situations where you may be able to get it become, but you still have issues of control from that perspective. And then the, this is another key aspect is how much of the future growth is priced today. So you see a number of these consolidation companies and the real question is, okay, you know, they're selling for a decent multiple. They've got a great growth model. Maybe you can rely on, on the growth to grow forward, but there's a number of things is, okay, if a lot of that is sort of captured in the price already, um, you, I think your margin of safety can become less just because of, from a pricing perspective. Um, and so what we're really looking for in our case from Bonhoeffer is we're looking for what's described as a Davis double opportunity where we can both get high growth and modest multiples. And you'll see that in the examples that we've provided later on. Uh, the automobile dealership market, I think, provides an interesting opportunity along those lines. So again, here's the categories of consolidators as per Scott management, going from roll up to platform to accumulated a holding company. Now holding company are sort of unrelated companies. These are companies like Lucadia, Bolare. And so these are basically unrelated companies um, and basically holding a, a group of businesses. Typically what happens with these businesses is the market will put a discount on this and the discount will be dependent upon how much control the family has and how much how well minority shareholders are treated. But even amongst the best ones that treat the minority shareholders the best, you're still going to get about a 20% discount in this hold co kind of situation. And then going from there, you've got an accumulator where basically you're, you're, you're accumulating different, different uh, companies in different, you know, different segments or different niches. You share operational excellence programs, but there's really not a whole lot more of integration. They're de run very decentralized. Probably the biggest example of that is sort of Constellation software. And then you, you move to the to the left further, you get sort of a platform where you have these clustering of subsidiaries, you know, where there's Don and Hare, Roper. Those are examples of companies where you have clusters of businesses. Then all the way over to the left, you sort of have a roll up where you have a high degree of integration um, in scale-driven synergies. And, and that's where we, we're sort of focusing on is looking at what are some interesting roll-up situations. Um, and, and, if, and it requires a different amount of sort of skill in each one. I think the roll-up, it's easier to basically integrate and, and show those, 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 those aspects. It gets more complex when you're dealing with platforms and accumulators because you're trying to spread experience across different companies. And so I think in terms of degree of difficulty, um, the roll-up is, is less difficult than let's say the accumulator. The accumulators, have done, they've done great companies, but they're really 
from what I see, really dependent upon a few people with a with a great vision. And a, as you can see over time, the accumulators will have a tendency to at times to basically have higher multiples than roll ups also. So um, the accumulators valuation or future returns are based upon being able to continue to have that great excellence, which in many cases it will, but then that's really then it's really driven by the underlying growth of the business. Meanwhile, in the roll up case, if you do have great management, you can get both the advantage of increasing multiples and the growth sort of working together to create to create returns going forward. Um, this is a second group, second way of sort of doing this. The nice thing I like about this particular approach is they talk about risks in each of the ones that we're going to focus on roll ups because that's where most of our most of our focus has been lately. So the opportunities, relatively ease of getting to tail volume TAM. I mean, the nice thing about it is in the automobile dealer market, you're in the market every day. You know who your competitors are. You get a really good sense of what's going on. You can get an idea of cultural fit before you do it. So there's a lot of a lot of unknowns or de-risking that can happen in roll-up situations if you do it right. Some of the risks, um, multiple escalation. And that's where I think Bound, uh, my my appraisal background, having worked in appraisal for 20 years, basically provides me somewhat of an advantage here to sort of say, okay, in looking at the acquisitions, how are we going to try and, what are we going to try and do? There's two things I look at as sort of the price pay, but then it's also return on incremental investing capital is another method that, that we look at to basically sort of capture this. Um, some Keith, of the thing, yes? Keith, we had a question come in um, sure. that I think would be great to address. Um, so the question is, um, and this is from a longtime follower, how much of what Keith describes as a change in approach to emphasizing unique um, drivers of growth really is a change relative to your historical investment strategy? Uh, is, is it truly new or is it just one more tool in the toolkit um, or something he, you are emphasizing for the portfolio overall across holdings? It's, I, I would say that it's, that it's really something that's more of an outgrowth of realizing that that what really drives a good amount of value is growth. So in essence, historically, we looked at growth, but there was more growth from an industry perspective, looking at industries that were doing relatively well. Now we've sort of delved a little bit deeper and said, okay, well, let's try and take a look at consolidation as an example of a theme that we can take a little bit more look into. And so we may be able to take a look at industries that may not be growing that great, but have great growth prospects for the individual companies. I think that's the difference because um, early on, we were focusing primarily on good industries with reasonable valuations. We still do that, but I think where, where our focus more now has been sort of trying to, to sort of dissect the, the growth the growth parameter associated with valuation. And by dissecting that, I mean, determining what are the what are the drivers or components of growth what's going to drive growth in the future and one of the observations that we made is if you look at some of these consolidating companies they're going up into the right in terms of their charts and what that really means is the market is underestimating the growth that's actually achieved in the business as time goes on and it seems to be a recurring phenomenon the other thing that we noticed with consolidation is if you look at most analyst estimates they don't include consolidation as part of their estimates going forward. So I think that's a missing piece that's out there. It's, 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 I would say it's not easily quantifiable. So it becomes a difficult thing for people to sort of capture in, in, in their valuations. And there's a, an inherent, I think, bias against acquisitions because there's been so many failures that have happened that are well publicized. But there are a number of places where acquisitions have added a lot of value. And I think sometimes those get over those those things will actually become that that emphasis basically becomes over overplays where the real good acquisitions are. So I, I think that's I think that's the way to sort of think about it is is, is that it's still in concert with our overall value philosophy. We're trying to find buying something for less than what we think it's worth. It's just an additional tool to delve down into and understand um, where value is coming from and peeling the onion a little bit down further to sort of going after where are the sources of growth and where can we identify those sources of growth before it shows up in the numbers. And so I think that's a key aspect of what we're trying to do here. Thanks, Keith. That's helpful. Okay. And so we've got, so again, this is, this is sort of the second, the second view of, 
a, a second model we have here in terms of consolidators. Um, and then, so, and then this is the third one, which is sort of the benchmarking of consolidators. This is just sort of way, how do we know what these sort of, um, whether these things are successful? And one of the ways to take a look at it is what's the return on invested capital plus half of organic growth gives you an idea of saying, okay, which 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 ones going forward are going to have the biggest growth? And so most of the companies that we're looking at probably will have, you know, th this number probably in the 15 to 20, 15 to 20 percent range. Um, but we're getting mul we're paying single digit multiples for it. So I think there's somewhat of a trade off here in terms of, uh, you know, growth potential versus price being paid for the particular uh, company at the time. We're going to transition here quickly into into changes in interest rates, which is sort of the second theme that, that we had mentioned before. Um, what's really happened is we've there's a continued reset from positive neg rates from negative rates last year. We've got an interesting situation where both bonds and stocks have declined at the same time. Inflation's presence, but future inflation is uncertain. To give you an idea of yeah, the magnitude, we've gone from minus minus 0. 0.7 to plus. Um, excuse me, from so yeah, from minus 0.7 to to plus 1.8 over the next um, you know over the past 12 months. What we've got here is a a chart that shows the long term real rates have gone down over time. Um, I think this is I mean, intuitively this makes sense um, as the as the economy's gotten less risky and there's less less things on overall basis over time. Things have gotten and what's happened is capital's accumulated. You expect as a result of supply and demand as capital capital accumulates, it doesn't get destroyed in things like war, famines, and epidemics. That the cost of it would go down. And that's all this chart is really showing over time. And where we are today, we're at 1.8% real. The long this long-term regression to say we're at 0.7, which would imply from a long-term perspective, there's more more weight to push rates down than to pull them up from that perspective. Um, so the implications here, um, the rising rates. Uh, will provide interesting situations for well and underwritten financials um, to generate above average profits, even if rates stabilize or go down. Some interesting areas of stress we've been looking at have been BDCs and some niche lenders. Um, and then it's interesting, you can look at some select fixed income rates of term being competitive with equity at this point in the cycle. Specifically, in terms of some specific data we have here, if we look at similar times in the past where you had rising rates, falling stock and bond prices accompanied by inflation, there were three major times that we can see. One was post-World War II, one was post the Vietnam Arab oil embargo, and the third one was in the Iranian Revolution. Um, and so these are similar times where we've had similar kinds of situations with inflation and both real and bond prices. And the, and the, the aftermaths of each of them have been different. I think we're primarily closer to the post-World War II, which is sort of the temporary inflation spike and what happens after that and what that that bodes well overall for the market from the perspective i don't see persistent inflation and, and part of the i think part of the reason for that is that the the, the market there's a lot of substitutes and the the difference between 70 the 73 and some to call it 78 time frame is that a lot of the products and the goods that we had were dependent upon oil and oil went up by multiples like of two to three times and that really rippled through the whole economy. Right now, even though increasing oil prices will increase some things, there's a lot of other substitutes and a lot of other ways, a lot of other aspects that the market isn't quite as sensitive to commodity shocks like it's been in the past from that perspective. Some interesting source material. If people want to take a look at sort of this 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 time frame in the past, is Buffett's letters. John Neff on investing is a very interesting book on um, the money masters and the intelligent investor. We're going to slightly go through. So, so Buffett, originally, his main things that he learned in these time frames is he invested in sort of these royalty type businesses, uh, product and service growth, um, TV stations at the time, newspapers and advertising agencies. O over time, those have become more competitive. And what you've really got now, one example of royalties that we can think of, let's say, in our portfolio is more of these distribution companies like dealerships. Um, so in essence, you basically are not actually dealing with the capital intensivity of having to invest in the products, but you're basically getting a royalty off of the sale of those products. And so that would be example. An example of that would be sort of a dealership in essence, where you're not investing in the cars. You may be borrowing money to hold cars on your lot, but in essence, you're basically getting a royalty off of the continued growth and sales of those. And John Neff, 
basically, if you, if you get a chance to read his book, it's a great book. Um, he basically breaks down growth firms in his portfolio between less recognized growth, moderate growth, and cyclical growth. And I think a lot of the companies that we're investing is more in this lucky, less recognized growth category where you're getting 10 to 20% year growth of earnings, which I think we are single digit PE and high ROEs. And, and participation in definable growth areas, which I think if you look at some of the the, the dealerships, we, we really have some of that aspect of the of the businesses that are parallel with NAF described as sort of less recognized growth. Um, some ben, some more more traditional sort of Ben Graham type of exercises that in in his latest ver version of the intelligent investor, he looks at okay bonds trading at a discount to par, special bonds. Which he mentioned at the time were savings bonds, which are equivalent to I bonds today, sort of net nets and deep value stock working at that time. Um, an interesting aspect of all these particular investors is at the time, which is applicable today, which wasn't applicable to 12 months ago, there's a trade off between bonds and stocks in regards to would you, what do you, would you like these in your portfolio? For example, Bond Buffett recommended munis at a rate of 9%, equivalent of a 9% after tax rate in February 1970. And J John Neff basically held bonds versus stocks when real rates were 5%. We're not there yet, but if we do, those are some interesting benchmarks that people in the past have used to sort of say, okay, we're getting to the tipping point where maybe it really bonds may make, may make a little bit more sense than stocks. So investment implications, again, bonds are more competitive stocks, look for well-underwritten sort of financial firms and high-yield bonds. Stocks, the stocks that should do well in this type of environment are shorter duration value stocks. So the, so the value the value aspect should pick up. Um, opportunities in stocks, efficient and good underwriting financial firms are, are always something, uh, another interesting area that we've, we've looked at. We haven't invested in the fund yet at this point, but if the prices do, do continue to if it prices to deteriorate or if their economics get better, I think that's an area that we, we have on sort of our watch list at this point. And consolidation growth can add value independent of rates, which I think is a, a very interesting thing over time. This it's almost a it's a it's a phenomenon that's happening independent of, of the other aspects of the business. So right now I'm going to transition into, into looking at two specific companies in terms of specific applications of what we had mentioned here in terms of some of these themes. So the first one is Asbury. Now, Asbury is a is a auto dealership. Um, it's got a great business model. It's it, it basically, in my mind, has both an online or omni omni channel approach to selling cars. Um, you get multiple s s revenue sources from new, used, service, finance, and insurance parts, and online. Um, there's a larger number of customers to interactions versus online only. So they they basically it's interesting the fact. They had this online only capability in 2020. What they realize when they when they're looking at their data is that 90% plus of the customers they get online would have never walked into an Asbury dealership. Um, I think part of it really has to do with the fact that it may be generational, but I think it's really a great tool for Asbury to use within their existing clusters to drive more volume. When you drive more volume within these clusters, which have relatively fixed costs, your margins will go up. So you really can accelerate the economies of scale happening within each of the clusters that Asbury has. This can be seen over time with average returns on equity of 30% plus, um, basically just running this kind of a model with uh, historically not that much um, online sales. Right now, if you take a look at the online sales, it's roughly 10% of the overall market. I think what they're looking to do from what I've heard from from some some calls has been roughly to maybe get up to 50%. And that's a huge amount of additional volume that, that Asbury can push into each one of the clusters. And I don't think that's really realized or sort of put into people's calculations when they think about dealerships. The ones that have good online platforms and good online customer service, the primarily the leaders in that have been Asbury and Lithia. Um, those create a lot of value, I think, in terms of being able to push volume through a specific um specific dealership it's good for two things the economics is good and then especially if the oems go to more of an agency model they're going to want to they're basically going to want to work with the players that have the highest volume in each of the markets and this this will sort of act as a double accelerator per se of, of let's say of growth that could happen with these businesses um, as we mentioned, so, so the company basically has a quad approach to growth. They pay down debt, buy new dealerships. 
They're using the internet to drive local volume and buying back shares. They, they, they are using dealerships to cluster to take advantage of the economies of scale, but when they, will, when they do acquisitions, they'll generally go into a new area and then acquire other dealerships within that area and then build on the clustering approach. They, they have a large runway with about 0.7 market share, percent market share. I think they've got 20% plus growth potential going forward. The online the online opportunity is incredible. Right? At this point, they only have 60% penetration. Over the next year, they're going to have another 40% penetration, and they only have 40% penetration for their finance and insurance product. What's going to happen over the next 12 months at, or as the normalization process happens in dealerships is Asbury, I think, has some unique aspects of adding growth of both this online and finance insurance product penetration, which will offset the decline in gross in gross profits that are expected as a result of auto sales normalizing. The other thing that Asbury and the other publicly dealers have is if you segment the, the amount of excess versus shortages of cars by, by, by brand name, primarily the excess is primarily in domestic car production. The shortages are primarily in the Japanese and Korean brands. And Asbury and the other publicly traded auto dealership groups have a much higher weighting in the, green, the Korean and the Japanese brands than in the excess brands. So even though this, this adjustment's going to happen, it's going to happen over a longer period of time, I think, for Asbury and the other guys like Lithia over time. And so what that's going to do is going to stretch out that, that decrease in gross profit. But then they'll also going to be supplemented by these growth, especially for Asbury. And I think the two may, you know, more the growth may may more than offset the decline in gross profit, just being back to a normal, a normalized situation when it comes to auto dealerships. So basically, this is just the overall market. Um, I'm not going to go into some of the details here. We already sort of talked about it. Sort of the key recurring revenues is aftermarket parts. Um, there's going to be demand increases. One of the big questions people have is, okay, when we go to electric cars, is there going to be less service? Um, one of the key aspects of that is, is that in Europe, we're sort of seeing that and what they're seeing in the automobile dealerships that have good service is the amount of service doesn't necessarily, they haven't, they haven't seen declines in that part of the market, even though people in theory would anticipate that. I think part of that may be due to the fact that what happens is that the OEM, when you, when you have the more complex cars, um, the OEMs are going to be in a better position to repair them than third party third party uh, people that do that. Um, so the other interesting thing about auto dealers is when you look at the automotive value chain, there's two parts that are very profitable. There's distribution and there's financing. And another aspect about the distribution business, it's very slow changing. A lot of the auto dealerships have been around for 50 to 100 years. Um, they have exclusive territories. And when you look at it overall, it's a very efficient way to distribute the products. Going directly to customers and having to deal with all the customers directly, I think, is a is is, is a daunting task. And I'm not sure that OEMs would want to not necessarily want to do that. I think what they where, where I think they want to go with, which would be more of some of this agency model for the ones that want to go that way, is just try to find the companies that have the high that are servicing the highest number of customers in the quickest period of time. One way to sort of measure that in auto dealerships is inventory turns. Inventory turns is telling you how fast are you matching people to cars. And Asbury has amongst the highest inventory turns. So when an OEM is looking for which distributors do I want to focus on in this agency model, it would definitely be one more like Asbury versus the ones that have the slower turns. So management management alignment here, it's pretty, pretty, um, pretty good. Um, even though they don't have, have 0.8% of ownership, the CEO does have large amounts of equity ownership as a percentage of his salary and other management. Um, most of the salary is incentive versus base. It's based off of the, the metrics that you'd like to see. Um, and so th I think those are th those are things that are important here. They have a modest amount, 1.1 equity grand per year for stock grants. So that's not, that's not a whole lot. They also have a capital allocation committee that's part of the board, which I think is unique and actually in, you know, basically elevates the the focus on capital allocation in terms of what the company wants to do going forward. This is primarily just a forward-looking valuation based upon what I think are reasonable sets of assumptions. Same store growth, four to five percent. M and A, four to five percent, and internet growth of ten percent. Again, that internet growth is just due to 
you know, the penetration and the, and the amount of new customers they really seem to be getting. It's a, it's somewhat of a new model. Um, I think, you know, it's, you know, Carvana and other people have shown that the internet model is, is appealing to young people and appe an appealing model. I think as the, as other people get into the market like Asbury and they can combine that with the services they provide, I think it becomes a very potent and a very, a very interesting way to, uh, to really sell new and used cars across the country. Um, and the other the interesting thing that Asbury has as a result of the clustering is the operational leverage. The margins has tripled well, with 70% earnings revenue growth, let's say over the past five years. Get the local economies of scale, and you really have another competitor, um, Lab that, or Lithia, that's doing the exact same, similar kind of things. And so you really have both, both of these models in the market that are working and that do provide this kind of interesting sort of growth growth profile in our mobile distribution. Um, so in terms of, of current valuation, it's like 5.1 times earnings, 2.3 times forward earnings. Again, it's relatively cheap. And so this is giving us sort of that Davis double approach where we'll have a low multiple if it gets re-rated. Um, with any kind of reasonable growth rates, you'll see the multiple the amount will go, the multiple will go up. And then also with the expected growth rates, if those are realized, you get sort of a, a sort of a combination. So if this thing goes from let's say five times to let's say eventually it gets valued at 15 times. And if the earnings goes up two or three times, you can just do the math in your head to sort of see that this thing has some real interesting potential. The real question is drilling into those assumptions and do those assumptions make sense? And I think that's where we sort of focused our time on looking sort of the internet aspect of the business and also how much more market can they really can they really take and have has this thing been done on a smaller scale over time, which is both Asbury and Lithia showing that they can do this um, as an as, as an alternative also is that if they can't find a dealership, they can buy back stock. And as long as your stock is selling at five times earnings, you're getting a 20% earnings yield on what you already have. Um, so the real question is uh, that people have is sort of the changing service needs for hybrids and EVs. Like I had mentioned before, Ilia, Bilia, which is a, a Swedish or Scandinavian um, auto companies on the front end of the transition, they're still generating very high returns on equity and finding other services, like for example, tire storage and changing services for EVs versus internal combustion cars. I'm sure there'll be other things they'll be able to find. One of the key areas I think that's gonna be interesting as we get to autonomous driving is you're, you're gonna have to have a lot of calibrations of sensors and that's gonna be a big market. So I think there's always gonna be something that's gonna go on where it's service guys We'll continue to have business. It's just going to be a little bit different than the service that we have today. So I guess what we got here from a conclusion perspective is we're buying growth for more than a reasonable price. We think it's the best combination of inventory turns and margins in the U.S. dealer space. And there's some upside from internet growth. And now the, sec the second thing that we're going to be talking about here is another company where we're looking looking at more of these transitions. For example, we get a combination of a legacy mature business cash generating sort of cash flows um, where you have a legacy business reinvesting cash flows into a new fast growing businesses. And so like, for example, in consolidated communication, you got legacy telecom cash flows are going to fund a new fiber optic build out scripts. You have legacy cash flows funding a new, different new opportunities associated with that. Those are, those are in the, the local TV market. Um, then, so then the other aspect of this is sort of valuation. How do you sort of value these markets? I mean, what's interesting is, Many of these firms are priced as though they're legacy declining markets. So, for example, um, a lot of the firms, Asbury has a 20% yield, earnings yield, as you mentioned before, Auto House, which is another one we're going to be talking about coming up here as a 19% yield. They provide this Davis double opportunity. And sort of the risks that are associated with these are basically, you know, transitioning as a new, you know, delay. The the primary risks are basically the timing of when specific events are going to happen, and so the timing of that can really can really uh, the market expects timing, and it's later than what the market expects. That's primarily, in my mind, the biggest risk. So eventually, it's going to get there, but it's a matter of the time from that perspective. So the second company we're looking at here that we just recently purchased a company called Auto Hellas. What the company does is it has a core rental business in Greece, is and started out in Greece by by selling like six VW, renting six VWB deals that's run by a very entrepreneurial family, um, expanded from Greece to the Balkans. What they did is they start out with used car rentals in sort of rental countries. And then what happens is they end up 
um, is it all, so what they do is they open up used car rental, excuse me, used car rental, used car sales locations in rental countries. And what that does is that basically when you're done, you buy a car, when you're done renting it, you sell it at the end. And so they've done that in a number of countries that they basically have the rental, the, the rental franchise. in. so again, they started in Greece, they did well there, and then they expanded to a number of other countries. What they've done in some countries parallel with that is they have auto distributorships in certain countries um, specifically for uh, auto, an auto dealer named Seat, where in essence they can do dis they can distribute Seat automobiles in multiple countries. They also have the Hyundai and Kia distributorship in Greece, which has been great because the market share of Hyundai and Kia has doubled over the past four years. And they've also have a dealership in Greece. So the two the two areas of growth focus going forward is to expand the rental network geographically. They're in the process of buying the Portu a Portugal Hertz franchise, then extend expand the distribution relationships they have in particular countries. They're in the process of buying the Stellantis dis distribution distribution agreement in Greece, they started out with um, primarily seat, and then they ended up getting the Hyundai Hyundai Kia. And now they're getting Stellantis. And the, the interesting thing about these is that the they're very, in, as you get these new distribution agreements, you have the infrastructure set up so the incremental profitability is very high. And they generate, the inter, another thing about auto health and some of these auto rental companies is they generate recurring gains from sales on rental cars. So what they'll do is they'll actually buy a car, they get a discount at the OEM when they originally buy the car, and then they rent it and then they sell it at the end. Now, some guys like Sixth actually have repurchase agreements, so they know exactly what prices they're going to get. Guys like Auto Hellas, they don't do that, but they're able to, to buy the right cars, in essence, to basically make a profit. And these guys have consistently made profits in reselling used cars at the end of the lease term. Um, right now, the Greece rental is about 50% short term, which is primarily vacation driven, and 50% longer term, which is corporate leasing. So, so you do have some diversification there. Um, and the continued growth is basically from the Portugal rental and the Stellantis distribution purchase are really in the next year really gonna gonna kick up. And again, this should have some a similar a similar sort of offsetting kind of a effect that what's going on in the United States with Asbury, as we mentioned. Um, right the past year, there's been a huge um positive aspect from renting in cars that, and the rental companies have made loads of money this past year. But then the, the rates the rates are expected to revert next year. In the case of auto health, you do have these two factors which will offset that versus your typical sort of rental car company like Six or Avis or the other rental car companies that are out there. So with these guys, they have five ways to grow, expand, expand the rental franchise to new countries, sell used cars in rental countries, expand distribution franchises, pay down debt, and distribute excess capital. I really do want to highlight the distribution of excess capital because there's two times this company has done this in, re in really interesting situations. One was before the great financial crisis. They basically made a large distribution and they did one last year too. So they seem to really have a sense of, okay, we have excess capital. We're going to give it back to the shareholders. If we keep, there's nothing we can do with it. Um, similar to, to and, and part of the issue in Greece, some of these other countries is just the buybacks can be some it can be restricted due to regulations and that's i think what's really happening in greece and why there's not as much let's say buybacks in greece as there could be in other countries and so in essence and also the family owns a good portion of it so the buyback is you know it's the question is okay what's what's the best way to sort of do that i think these distributions provide another another outlet for them like we had mentioned before, in terms of growth, your key and Hyundai distribution franchises double in size over the past four years. If you look at historically the revenue and EPS growth, they've been excellent. And there's going forward that we did talk about the opportunistic distributions that happened in 2007, 2022, when they do have excess capital, they are very active in terms of trying to get that capital back to shareholders. Um, sort of the business, we talked about it before in terms of the leasing business, it's fragmented market by country. Six and Hertz have the larger, are the largest competitors worldwide, can develop recurring cash flows from trading, which Auto Health is really good at. Um, some competitors are controlled by the OEMs, Europa Car is controlled by VW, and it seems to be consolidating over time. The, the dealer market 
especially in Europe, is hugely fragmented. Consolidation is beginning, but in, in, in Europe, it's really a lot more fragmented than it is in the U.S. There's a long runway in, in the dealers, but it's in the early stages of consolidation, leasing's further along the consolidation process. So that's why that's part of the reason what, which makes this company interesting. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about management here. Family owns 60% of the business. Equity ownership level, the CEO and other family members basically have equity ownership levels of 15 times their combined salaries. So they're definitely incentivized to do the right thing, I believe. To give you some examples, um, the cash incentive for the CEO is about one time salary. He has a very modest salary of $200,000 and his salary is less than, than other senior executives. I mean, that's an interesting it's an interesting thing I try to find, look at in companies is when the CEO's salary is less than other ones. In my mind, that's really a positive aspect, just from the fact that you know you don't, the, we're not we're not going to the CEO doesn't feel he's entitled to all this additional amount just because he's the CEO. And they've done some skilled capital allocation, including the excess capital distribution and acquisitions that, as we had mentioned previously. Again, this is sort of the forward-looking valuations. Um, the dealership distribution group should some, have some robust growth of roughly about 10% annually. Rental growth is probably closer to 3 to 4%. This 10% annually actually is from their, when they do an impairment test, they have to put a plan of what they think the forward revenue is going to be. And then their current um, annual report, they have that about 10% annually. So I think that's a supportable number from what manage, at least from what management set of assumptions are in the analyses they need to do on a yearly basis for financial reporting. Um, again, the margin is going to increase to, as we get this clustering similar to what we did with the distributorships and dealerships. Um, 25 Right now, we've got 25% of income from dealers, distributorships, 75% from leasing. That dealer distributorship amount is going to be growing since it's growing faster over time. Um, then the recurring trading revenue really provides about 30% per year historically. And I think that's a real interesting aspect and maybe an overlooked aspect in a lot of these kind of business and a lot of the rental businesses specifically. And the fact that it not only happens in this business, but if you look at companies like United Rentals and Ash Teed, it also happens in other businesses. But I think it can be an easily overlooked profit center for a lot of these types of businesses. So we look, this is just on a relative basis, just looking at, at what the valuation is. They're all, they're all pretty modest, but I think Auto House has some real interesting, has more interesting um, growth prospects. You are getting a modest PE with very interesting growth prospects. Sort of in the end here, you're getting you know, 5.3 times EBS. Now, the, with this excluding, they have about $2 per share in excess earnings. These are holdings in Aegean Airlines, and they also have holdings in a, in a golf course on Crete. Um, and roughly three times 2026. And again, if we, if we take, take a look at what we think would be reasonable multiples, what you're going to get here, I think like what we had mentioned in Asbury is you're basically going to get an increase in earnings over time, plus a, re, a potential re-rating of the multiple. And those two effects will basically act, will be multiplicative and could potentially uh, you know, increase the value of the stock. And those are the types of situations that we're really looking for in a number of the, and that's primarily what the focus has been in terms of us looking at new situations and you'll you'll notice in terms of each one that we have that's sort of the combination that we've been looking for in terms of transitioning to find these kind of businesses that have the potential for growth but still are trading at modest multiples and so that's that that's that's the end of the presentation so if anyone has any questions you know feel free to uh yeah to, keith a question did come in yeah. i think um a good one to build off your last point there but um mm -hmm. what are your views on valuations in the current market more generally and how does that compare and contrast globally and we are butting up against the hour here so um if we can get your thoughts and and then we'll we'll kind of close up sure sure so i mean i i think Again, it depends upon the specific segment you're looking at. I mean, we're finding a lot of really interesting situations in the U.S., despite the overall maybe higher versus overseas. I think the real thing you need to look at is what are the economics of the businesses. So, for example, let's take a look at the car dealerships. Car dealerships are cheap in the U.S., they're cheap in Europe. But the but I think the big difference is is where are we in the consolidation process, and we're almost I think we're at a bit better inflection point in the U.S. in terms of what's going on than in Europe. And so Europe may be at this inflection point at some point in the future, but we're I think we're closer to that right now in terms of actually seeing a lot of the synergy showing up in earnings of businesses in the U.S. And so I think on a Overall basis, I think you need to look at it company, you know, company by company and situation by situation. 
um, because the aggregates, I think it, they can be misleading in the fact that even though the U.S. numbers are high and the foreign ones are low, you really need to dig into the situations and find things where you're comfortable. And for example, in the European situation, even though the Europe, some of the European, like for example, the UK auto dealers sell at a much cheaper price than the US auto dealers, the reason is, is because it's a much more competitive market. So what you really need to do when you compare these multiples is you really need to dig down and understand the economics. If the economics is not as good, they deserve a lower multiple. If it's if they if they've got the same economics, then then that comparison makes sense. But I think you really need to sort of dive down and sort of see what is specifically what are the economics of the situations you're comparing to and then i think you probably can make a better a better assessment part of the issue too with a lot of stuff when you're comparing country basis is there's there can also can also be some you know biases when it comes to you know the the weightings of various um securities or the weighting of various industries and various country benchmarks and those need to be adjusted too so i, I think you got to look at the specifics I mean, there can you can make some general points, but I think looking at the specifics, I think is the is the key aspect behind any of these types of sort of decisions that are, that that are made. Great. All right. Well, we are at the hour mark. A heck of a lot to pack into one hour only. Yeah. So we do welcome any follow up questions directly to Keith or myself, and we're happy to set up any um, conversations um, post event. Thanks so much for joining us, and have a great right, day. All right. Thanks.